justice is eternal. Injustice is temporal. This is a profound insight that lurks within the human soul, but it's rarely articulated in this fashion. Usually it comes gushing forth in chaotic, emotion-charged protests against injustice. During the final week of May 2020, Minneapolis erupted in a volcano of human outrage. Outrage over what appeared to be the unjust death of a man named George Floyd. George was arrested by Minneapolis police, and instead of putting him in the patrol car and driving him away, they laid him in the street, handcuffed, and Officer Eric Chauvin put his knee on his neck, despite George's complaint that he could not breathe after eight minutes. The prisoner was dead. Sidewalk protesters said, let him breathe, but they continued to suffocate him. It appeared to millions of people who saw the videotape that there was probable cause to arrest the police for the crime of murder. Even the mayor of Minneapolis said it looked to him like murder, even though he did not want to prejudice the law. The former mayor of Baltimore, who had gone through a similar experience in 2015, said it looked to her like murder. But the Hennepin County prosecutor did not find probable cause to arrest the police officer, and so outraged erupted in the name of justice. Injustice had been perpetrated, but there was a demand for justice, and it wasn't just black versus white, power struggle, all races in. Minneapolis want the same justice. What is at stake in Minneapolis is retributive justice. Justice comes to us in three forms. Distributive, that's fairness and distribution. Retributive, the punishment should meet the crime. Restorative, that's re-establishing peace and tranquility and equality after an injustice has been done, we recognize injustice as ordinary, but we expect from our government to represent the eternal and to exact justice as fairness and retribution. And when that doesn't happen, then it inhibits our work of restorative justice, where we attempt to right past wrongs, where we attempt to reestablish the social fabric based on equity and justice in all three forms. Some years ago, this is my family. My gosh, did we have fun around the dinner table with all these teenagers, some adopted, some borrowed, but all one family. Now we ask, what role does race play? Systemic racism. Outrage is not over merely what happened on May 25, 2020. No, our outrage is over decades of systematic racial discrimination that has victimized African Americans and other minorities, those marginalized by the dominant society. And even though those white liberals claim not to be prejudiced, 
we have every right to ask why then does racism continue? I think it's time for the white race to apologize to all the non-white races for the inability to exact justice in its distributive, retributive, and restorative forms. Even if you are not a religious person, when you feel that sense of outrage rising up over an injustice, not just because it happened, but out of fear that the government and the culture and the society no longer feels responsibility for exacting the eternal standards of justice, then I hate to tell you that is a religious feeling because it's grounded in your deep trust that God, the transcendent God, will sustain the standards of justice both in life and in death, both in time and in eternity. Many critics of both Islam and Christianity don't like judgmentalism, don't like the idea of a judgment after death, but Deep down, not just Muslims and Christians, deep down in virtually all human beings is this truth. The truth that justice comes from God and injustice in this life will be met with justice in the next.